What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Wo Long Fallen Dynasty, a Souls-like set in the Three Kingdoms period of China with a dark fantasy twist. But to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on YouTube. And while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. And if you're curious about everything that entails, there's a video linked in the description below. And if you're not subscribed, you can go to my channel and it'll be the first video you see as well. Furthermore, my Steam profile is public and linked in the description below. And the last thing I need to mention up front is that I did receive a review key for this particular game a couple of days before it launched launched, however it was not enough time to get the review out before then, so I put up a first impressions video for the embargo date instead, so keep in mind that I got a good head start on this one. Now, as I've already mentioned, Wo Long is a Souls-like set in the Three Kingdoms period of China. This was a roughly couple decade long period, starting in about 180 AD, so while the game does touch on historical things that we know happened, kind of anything dealing with that this far gone is bound to be an interpretation of course, and that's before we even start attributing all of the dark fantasy and demons, etc. to it. But before we get into all of that, I would like to talk about the technical side of things. First and foremost, I played this game on PC, and if you've looked at the PC reviews for this game, it's got quite a few problems in that regard. Problems that make it very frustrating to play even beyond the scope of what you would expect from a Souls-like. Games that are known for being difficult, but the PC port of this game is in a rough place. Place. So to outline some of those issues, first and foremost, we have the PC controls. Now, a lot of people will tell you to play this kind of game with a controller, and that is sound advice. I would absolutely recommend the same for most people. However, if you're like myself, I am infinitely more comfortable with a keyboard and mouse than I am with a controller, regardless of what game it is. So that's always going to be my go-to. So with that in mind, and having reviewed Souls Likes previously, Wolong has some of the worst PC controls I've seen for a game since the original Dark Dark Souls was brought to PC. A lot of the buttons are not initially mapped in any kind of way that makes sense. The button prompts that are presented to try to teach you what to do when, as part of the prologue, are also really poorly explained. But let's be real, all of those problems could be solved by simply using a controller. What using a controller on PC will not fix, however, is the variety of other issues the game has. For starters, the frequent crashes. This game crashed more than a dozen times on me, almost always while the game was trying to play a cutscene, and occasionally this resulted in me having to re-defeat a boss. Eventually, after this kept happening, I just started skipping through the cutscenes and then going back to the main menu to watch them when I had a chance because they will get saved there. In addition to this, the frame rate is unstable. You do have a variety of options here on PC, of course, and you can set the game to prioritize FPS or performance or the resolution, but even adjusting all of that, the frame rate will still dip considerably in certain levels in particular, while at the same time, other levels would play almost flawlessly. So it was a weird mix of very unstable performance. In addition to that, the systems at play would would sometimes just not work. For instance, locking onto an enemy would sometimes just stop working, meaning that the button to press to lock onto an enemy, even if they're right in front of you, just would not work. In addition to that, the key mapping for assigning a target switch would also just not work no matter what I assigned it to. The lock on would only ever switch simply by moving the mouse in that general direction, which is a problem for a game that has multiple fast moving enemies on screen sometimes. So all of that said, I think it's pretty obvious that Wolong Fallen Dynasty has a lot of problems on PC that can make the experience more difficult than it really should be. Because while Wolong is a Souls-like and that comes with a certain degree of difficulty, I would not call it a particularly difficult game. Which brings us to the difficulty and sort of new game plus section of the video. Now initially there is only one difficulty, but once you beat the game you'll unlock a new difficulty, kind of, the way the game is structured is mission oriented, and once you beat the game you can switch via the mission select to a harder version of those missions called Rising Dragon difficulty, which is this game's version of a new game plus. However, the only thing this really adds is new items, and as we'll get to in the itemization part of the video, that's not particularly interesting. But as for the rest of the game, the prologue and the first boss can certainly be challenging, as the first boss largely serves as a tutorial for 
for the parry system. More often than not, this game wants you to parry as opposed to block. Specifically, they want you to parry critical blows, which are when the enemy flashes red and does some special attack. If you parry that, you'll counterattack and deal a bunch of damage. And the first boss serves as a tutorial for that mechanic. You basically can't progress until you learn it. Kind of literally, as you cannot leave the prologue or do anything else until that boss is defeated. However, at the same time, I would tell you, the first boss is the single most difficult boss in the game. Every other boss does not come anywhere close to the first one. In fact, the first boss is one of only a handful of bosses that have a second phase, and you have other options for the rest of the game as well. So the prologue is difficult, but it gets much easier afterwards. And while I can see what they were trying to do with the prologue, that first boss is not really representative of the difficulty for the rest of the game either. But speaking of the rest of the game, let's talk a little bit about the structure of this one as we move forward, because I think it's important to know. Wolong uses a sort of mission structure. Now, initially, you're kind of just moving through the first couple of levels until you get access to the hidden village, which acts as a sort of hub area, which will allow you to go there, craft, deal with your inventory, talk to some NPCs, etc. And then you will select missions from here. You select missions by planting your battle flags, which you can rest at, and then level up, manage your reinforcements, travel to a different mission, etc. Much like every other Souls-like, resting at these will reset enemies in the area outside of select bosses, changes to the environment like unlocking shortcuts, etc. Planting the battle flags is also very important to the morale system, which we'll talk about in the combat section. But then just a quick note on character creation. You can create your own character, but keep in mind this is purely cosmetic, though you do have a wide variety of options, more than I was expecting, mind you. Though, at least for me, this isn't the kind of game where I typically want to create my own character. Though one interesting thing is that they have you pick a sort of voice that will decide how your character sounds in combat, as there are no actual voice lines in the game, which felt like a slightly strange addition. But beyond that, a surprising amount of options for character creation, even if it is just a cosmetic choice. Let's talk progression systems. While Wolong comes across as having a pretty deep set of progression systems initially, it's really not, especially when it comes to the itemizations, which I think is probably the weakest part of the game. But let's walk through the basics. Like every other Souls-like, we defeat enemies, gather experience from them, we spend this experience at the resting points to level our various attributes up, which in this case is called the Five Virtues, or Five Phases. Each of these phases represents an element and corresponds to a few other things in the game. Most importantly, though, weapon scaling. You'll start seeing diminishing returns for these investments pretty quickly, and by the time you put 30 points into something, your derivative stats will be getting less than half of the benefit, with the exception of damage scaling. So the damage scaling always works based off of the tier of scaling assigned to the weapon you're using, whereas the secondary stats, so to speak, will start to fall off as you put more points into a single phase. But this is sort of countered by the fact that most weapons scale off of multiple phases simultaneously, meaning that it doesn't pick your highest, but rather it uses both, or in some cases even three. So this means in the early parts of the game, spreading out these attributes is usually the better way to go, because then you'll increase all those secondary bonuses at maximum benefit, while still increasing your damage via the weapon scaling, as long as you're paying attention to what phases your weapons are actually scaling off of. The virtues are also tied to a handful of other systems like resistance and damage, especially when it comes to wizardry. Every five levels, you'll be given a point per phase to learn wizardry for that particular element. You can learn these even if you can't use them. Each wizardry requires a minimum in the appropriate phase and also a set amount of morale. Now, unfortunately, most of the wizardry isn't very good. Not to say that it can't be, but a lot of it scales off of your phases as well, so the damage is going to be directly tied to how much you have in that associated element. Outside of some direct damage as well as some buffs, a lot of of them just aren't terribly useful, and truth be told, I found a lot of the wizardry a little bit boring, though there are some really good ones, such as Absorb Vitality from the Wood phase, which will give you healing per hit. The Fire phase has an Amplified Damage spell, which increases the damage you deal and take, which was fun. And then most trees also have a flat damage boost to the weapon you're using, which will also inflict a status ailment, which can be pretty universally helpful. 
But in addition to this, each bit of wizardry costs a certain amount of spirit, which is an in-combat resource, and if you hit a certain amount of it, you'll be stunned for a short period. So because of this, a lot of the really good spells have a sort of cost-benefit associated with them to how much of a hit your spirit is going to take when you use them, but as you hit enemies, your spirit increases. So there is no just set caster option, so to speak. You're going to need to engage in the melee combat to really use any of these spells anyway, at least effectively. So while you do have a lot of options, here, it doesn't really feel like there's a lot of builds associated with it either, because a lot of this stuff just does the same thing, but with a different element. All of that brings us to our armor and weapons. So on the face of it, this is an almost Diablo-like loot system. You'll be getting tons of loot. Almost all of it is going to be worthless. Now in terms of weapons, the type of weapon you are using, of course, determines your various types of attacks, and each weapon has a set of martial arts associated with it, which is some special attacks you can use. So what weapons you're using is pretty important. But both weapons and armor come in up to five stars in terms of rarity. And this is important because the higher the rarity, the more effects that that piece of equipment will have on it. So in theory, what you would want to do here is search for that higher rarity equipment to get the various effects. However, even this is made mostly pointless by the crafting systems. You see, there is an embedment option once you unlock crafting, which you get when you unlock the hub area area, the hidden village. But once you have access to this, you can pretty freely swap out and change the various enchantments on any piece of gear. So all you really need to do is find an appropriate rarity of the equipment you want, and then you can change out the individual effects as you please, which means it's pretty easy to very quickly get exactly the effects you want, at which point you never really need to change that equipment again, but you are still being bombarded with equipment as you get it as rewards for everything. And to top it off, you can even transmog your items, which means that even the visual appearance of them doesn't require you to find more loot. And to me, this entire loot system just felt off. I got high rarity equipment very early, put the stats I wanted on it, and then I just never changed it because there just wasn't any reason to. Here's the other part of this, though. Even if none of the equipment had these stats, it probably wouldn't matter because most of the benefits from these stats are so small, they don't make a huge difference unless they're on every every piece of equipment that you have. Most of the increases are roughly 2-3% to per item, and you only get a few equipment slots. So it's not like these special effects are even giving you that much of a benefit to begin with. So much so that really the only important thing for the crafting is upgrading your equipment. You can upgrade equipment up to 9 times, which will increase their base defense as well as their base damage in the case of your weapons, and that's pretty important, but beyond that, it just didn't really feel necessary to mess with the equipment much at all, despite it clearly being presented as a sort of key feature. Now, from there, just a couple more notes on progression. Like most Souls-like, you'll also be upgrading your healing item as you go in terms of more uses and more potency. You'll do this by finding items scattered throughout the missions. And then there is Divine Beasts and Reinforcements. As you play through the game, you'll get access to Divine Beasts, and as you engage in combat, you'll fill up a meter that will allow you to either buff your party or summon a Divine beast to have an effect on the battlefield. As you play through the game, you'll get more and more of these divine beasts to use, and they're all associated with a phase, so ideally you want to be using one in terms of damage that is your highest stat. But realistically, I found the healing one to be the most useful, as it is a full heal no matter what. Then we have our reinforcements. Also, as we play through the game, you'll be able to summon NPCs with you to help, and these are set individuals from the time period. And in many missions, these NPCs are actually mandatory. So while you can summon up to two of them, they're going to be with you regardless. But having them with you increases their oath level, and you can even earn some items through various challenges that will increase these faster, but at maximum oath, these characters will deliver you a full set of top rarity tier armor that they are using, so the visual style they have, which is a pretty great way to get great gear early on. Now, all of that said, that finally brings us to the combat section. Now, as I'm sure you've seen on screen up to this point, it is fast-paced, and it has a huge emphasis on parrying. But the basics here are your normal attacks, your heavy or spirit attacks, as they're called, and then the fatal strikes, most of which I 
operates around the spirit gauge. Yourself as well as enemies have a spirit gauge and it determines quite a bit. Basically on enemies you want to fill up the orange bar until it maxes out because this will stun them and open them up for a fatal strike. Now you can fill this bar up faster by lowering the amount you need to fill by hitting the enemy with spirit attacks or your heavy attacks. There are a couple of ways to do this. Either just use a heavy attack which will eat into your own spirit gauge or by counterattacking a critical blow. Critical blows are when the enemy flash red and do a big high damage move. However, if you parry that move, you will then counterattack, which will both deal increased damage to the enemy as well as filling up a significant portion of their spirit gauge while also lowering the threshold quite a bit at the same time. So much so that most enemies can be trivialized by effectively parrying their critical blows. But once that gauge is full, they'll get staggered for a second and you have a limited amount of time to hit them with a fatal strike, which is effectively just a heavy attack while the enemy is stunned. This will of course deal absolutely massive damage and usually open them up for a few extra hits afterwards as well. Now regardless of what weapons you're using, what your attributes are, that's basically the general gist of it. And once you get the hang of it, it's a lot of fun. Now obviously enemies will throw some curveballs at you, some of them are incredibly fast. Sometimes you're fighting so many enemies that doing all of this is a problem, etc, etc. But one of the key things I want to talk about is actually learning when to block versus when to parry. See, the game sets you up to think you should be trying to parry everything, but sometimes it's better to just block, especially in terms of incredibly fast enemies. Sometimes they hit so quickly that you can't really effectively parry every blow, so it's better to just block in those instances usually, as this will keep you from taking damage. Which seems obvious, but I only highlight it because the game puts so much emphasis on parrying things at the right moment that it's easy to forget that sometimes you can just block. But a couple of other notes, all of the combat is kind of dictated by the morale system. Now you can outlevel certain stages to the point where this doesn't matter, but morale plays a big part in combat as well. This is effectively a numerical value assigned to your character on a per level basis. That is to say per stage basis, if you will. But basically defeating enemies and not taking damage from critical blows will raise your morale. Higher morale means less damage taken and more damage dealt. Enemies can lower your morale by hitting you with critical blows or defeating you. This will lower your morale by at least one. However, we also have a fortitude rank. Fortitude is a minimum morale. When you plant your battle flags or their smaller version known as a marker flag, this will raise your fortitude, thus meaning that you won't ever have below that minimum. And they kind of use this as a way to encourage exploration of various parts of a level because assuming you are near the level target of a particular mission, trying to fight something with say 19 morale while you only have like two is basically a death sentence. That enemy is probably going to be able to one shot you. So you're going to need to explore the level a little bit, plant some flags, raise that morale up, and then you'll probably be good to to go. But it's an important system to note, but one that is easy to overlook. But assuming all else fails, you can usually have reinforcements with you, including for most boss fights. In many instances, this is mandatory. A lot of missions require you to have a certain person with you, and this applies to boss fights. There are a handful of missions, and especially side challenges, where you'll have to fight bosses by yourself, that kind of thing. But in many of the story missions, you can and likely will have help. If not from NPCs, then taking part in the co-op multiplayer, which is also available. In addition to PvP, of course, if you're into that thing, uses the standard sort of invade system we see in Souls Likes. But while the NPC versions won't do a ton of damage, what they are good at is distracting the enemy which will usually open them up to getting hit by you. And outside of a couple of bosses, this is why the rest of the game outside of the prologue tends to be so easy, because you have this help and they tend to distract the boss, which makes your life a lot easier. Which is part of the reason why the healing Divine Beast is so good. You see, your character can heal via potions, and if you're rationing those particularly well, that Divine Beast might not be super helpful. But what you can't do is cure your allies this way. However, However, if they get low on health and you use this healing divine beast, they also get healed to full health. And compared to the small burst of damage or potential status effects of the other divine beasts, I found the healing one to be by far and away the best. All of that finally brings us to our Steam Deck compatibility. Now, I personally was very curious how this was going to run on the Steam Deck given all of the other problems with the PC port. And I would say somewhat ironically, the Steam Deck does fix 
fix most of the problems with the PC port, while at the same time not being able to give you a frame rate that makes it an enjoyable experience. So with the Steam Deck, you have the built-in controller, of course. For some reason, this fixes the weird problem with the camera that is also present on PC that sees it only being able to be moved in increments almost. But unfortunately, no matter what I tried here, even messing around with the graphic settings on the absolute lowest setting, telling it to prioritize FPS, etc., I just could not get a good enough frame rate to really play this on Steam Deck, especially when it comes to incredibly fast moving enemies. So while you can get the game running on Steam Deck, I wouldn't really recommend it by any stretch of the imagination simply because the FPS, no matter the graphic settings, is just really, really bad. And this is simply not the kind of game where that's going to be acceptable. But all of that brings us to our positives, negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. Now, on the positive side of things, combat is actually pretty fun. Once you get a handle on all the systems and gain some mastery over them, combat can be pretty enjoyable, which is helped along by the game's level design. A lot of the levels are fun to move through, they're fun to look at, all the little side passages and secrets that you can find. A lot of that stuff is fun to engage with, and I would say in that regard, Wolong is a pretty good experience. However, I think that is beset by some serious negatives beyond even the PC port of the title. Now, obviously, though, the state of that PC port is a huge negative for me having played it on PC. The game is just in a bad place on PC. However, even beyond that, the game still has some major flaws in my opinion. The itemization is just not good. Most of the items you're picking up are useless. You're going to find items that you'll likely take through the rest of the game as early as the first couple of missions. The tutorial of the title is the most difficult part of the game, which is crazy to me. And then honestly, most of the builds even wind up feeling mostly the same, because a lot of the wizardry is just the same type of stuff with a different element attached. In fact, I would say what changed up my playstyle the most is what weapon I happen to be using. But all of those side systems, with the phases, the elements, the wizardry, a lot of that stuff felt the same no matter what I was using, which personally I found a little disappointing. So all of that brings me to my conclusion which is that the core concepts of Wolong Fallen Dynasty are solid. They're fun to engage with even. The combat, while it can feel a little samey in a lot of cases, is still fun to play with. The sort of high risk, high reward of that parry and critical blow system can be very fun. But the problem is, at least for me, that it seems like every system that surrounds that core experience is just very underwhelming. So when it comes to recommending this game or not, that does become a little bit easier simply because this is a Game Pass title. So if you have Game Pass, you can try it out relatively risk free, which means that regardless of what I've just stated, there's not a huge barrier to entry. However, if you're looking at actually paying for this game, quite frankly, I would have to give it a buy on sale for me. On PC, it is in a very rough place. And while I played through the entire game on keyboard and mouse, so it is possible I didn't run into anything game breaking. And because of that, I wouldn't outright say don't even think about it on PC. But I would only play this on PC if you plan on doing so with a controller, which admittedly, I'm too stubborn to do. But even outside of the controls, you're gonna have some problems on PC, unfortunately. But then even on consoles, you have all the other issues that I listed, and because of all that, the game is just across the board a buy on sale for me. The core experience is solid, but it is a game beset by annoying problems otherwise, or systems that fail to live up to expectations, I would say. All of that has been my review for Wo Long Fallen Dynasty. I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.